So thank you very much, Alan, for a wonderful uh, speech. Um, now, after these two talks um, that we just heard, uh, I, it is my pleasure to introduce the keynote speaker um, of this session, Peter Bartlett. Um, so Peter is a professor in the Computer Science Division and the Department of Statistics at UC Berkeley. And he's currently also the associate um, head or director, is it called? Associate director um, of the Simons Institute uh, for computing, uh, for the theory of computing at UC Berkeley. So he's really a pioneer in the theory of uh, neural networks. He started to study neural networks when they were not cool yet. Um, already in his uh, PhD thesis, um, he uh, studied um, you know, statistical learning theory and uh, neural networks, and he has written books about um, the theory of neural networks already in 1999. Um, he's going to give us a bit of an overview, I think, now um, in his talk as well. And he has a lot of different honors, which again, I don't want to uh, list all of them. He has received, uh, for example, he's a fellow of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics, a fellow of the ACM. He was elected uh, to the Australian Academy of Sciences in 2015, et cetera, et cetera. So without further ado, uh, welcome, Peter. <laughs> All right, thanks very much, uh, Caroline. Um, I'm delighted to be here, uh, especially in a session that's honoring, honoring Alan. This is really, um, really very exciting. So thanks a lot for inviting me. Uh, so the um, talk that I want to give today uh, is about uh, one of the central issues in the foundations of machine learning, uh, this tension between uh, computation and, and statistics, uh, between optimization and estimation, sorts of issues, and I think it's, it's really a central feature uh, in, in uh, understanding machine learning methods. Um, I guess I'm actually not going to talk about, very much about, about the past. Um, uh, the focus really in this talk is, uh, is forward-looking, is looking at um, what are some of the key open problems in this area, uh, and I guess I'll mention a, a couple of recent results. Um, but, you know, it's very much uh, a talk about what we don't know. Um, and if you're talking about machine learning, and particularly the foundations of machine learning, the, the elephant in the room here is deep learning. Uh, it's been hugely successful. This is the latest incarnation of, of neural nets. I guess the, at the time when I wrote the, that, uh, that book, uh, neural networks were a, a hot thing. Uh, you know, this was the... The, um, uh, the 1990s, uh, and, and then uh, there was a lot of disillusionment that we didn't know how to solve the optimization problems that were associated with, with this uh, family of, of non-parametric estimation methods, uh, and uh, most people lost interest for a while, but you know, the practitioners kept going with, with these things, and of course, with huge success. But what I want to talk about is you know, how, we, how we can view this latest version of, of neural networks, deep neural networks, is non-parametric statistical methodology, um, and really what we don't know about it. Uh, so some of the, the big surprises, the mysteries that have emerged from, from uh, the, these uh, methods that have been so successful in practice. So I'll talk a bit about a couple of those, of those mysteries. And then the second and, and shorter part of the talk is looking at um, computational aspects of uh, some very simple statistical estimation problems. And I think, again, there are some really interesting open questions uh, and important directions here. And I think this will be explored a bit more in the, in the panel discussion afterwards. OK, so um, uh, of course, uh, everybody's seen these huge successes that deep learning methods have, have had. Uh, the, um, the most uh, successful commercial uh, systems for labeling uh, objects in images, for uh, speech recognition, for machine translation. Uh, these are all based on deep neural networks now, and that's a that's a huge change uh, over over the last um, the last few years. So they've had an enormous impact, um, but I would argue that uh, we really don't know very much about how they work. You know, we're we're in an era of craftsmanship. That, that the practitioners have been engineering solutions to practical problems, um, really striving for better and better performance on, on particular benchmark uh, 
uh, data sets, but um, uh, you know, without the sort of rigorous foundations that uh, I guess in a place like Lids we would we would really uh, we'd really hope for. Uh, of course, you know, you can point to the, some of the ingredients of this success. Uh, it's, it's certainly essential to have a lot of data. It's essential to have a lot of computation. But, you know, what are the other ingredients? What's really behind their success? And what's, what are the situations where we, we can and can't effectively use this sort of uh, technology? Uh, we really don't know. Huge gaps in our understanding. Um, and, and uh, you know, I think the situation uh, currently is that practitioners have stumbled on this methodology that's um, hugely successful, but actually contradicts established statistical wisdom in some pretty, pretty uh, precise and quantifiable ways. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and, and of course, this is a, a really important challenge, you know, developing these, this, this uh, rigorous understanding of, of these methods um, uh, that, that will allow us, of course, to, Im to improve it. And, and, and perhaps, you know, I, I don't see any fundamental reason why deep neural nets are the, are the only technology that could be as successful on these sort of problems that um, we've seen these, these big advances. Okay, so um, let me pause there and have a little bit of a digression. So looking at the, the list of speakers on the agenda, um, I was led to ask, you know, why am I speaking here? I, I don't have a LIDS pedigree. Um, shortly after my, my PhD, uh, I, I was uh, faculty at the Department of Systems Engineering at the Australian National University, uh, and it was led by, by Brian Anderson and, and John Moore. Um, uh, so this was, this was focused on uh, control theory, signal processing, uh, systems theory, uh, I, I, I guess this combination of areas that we have, we have Alan, Alan to thank for. Um, uh, and... Um, uh, you know, I guess it's actually uh, something like the, the Australian cousins to, the, uh, to, to LIDS. You know, it was really great to see so many familiar faces here uh, from, from my time at Systems Engineering. There are a bunch of people that, that, that came to visit um, and, and uh, that I got to know because of uh, 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 my time at Systems Engineering. Um, so one of the things that Brian Anderson was, was famous for and worked on a lot was uh, a, an adaptive control approach, model reference adaptive control approach that came out of MIT, not out of LIDS, out of a next door neighbor. There was an aero astro professor, Philip Whitaker, in the late 50s, early 60s, that, that proposed this uh, MIT rule. Um, uh, I, I couldn't find a paper, I could only find a patent. Um, uh, and, and actually, it's really rather reminiscent of the, the situation in deep learning. Right, so in a model reference adaptive control, you have a reference system. You'd like the uh, control system to have its, its output uh, closely matching this reference system's output. And, and so you can come up with a criterion that's, you know, how much do these, do these two uh, uh, signals, how, how close are these two signals? Uh, and the big idea here was to, you know, compute a derivative of some parameter you want to adjust um, uh, a derivative of this criterion with respect to some parameter you want to adjust and, and, and move in the downhill direction. Uh, and, and, you know, the situation really is very reminiscent of, of uh, the way things work in, in, in deep learning. Uh, there was a lot of mystery around when these kinds of things would, would work well and, uh, and when they would lead to, to crazy instabilities. This was one of, one of the focuses that Brian had over quite a, quite a long period. Okay, so back to deep learning. Um, I, I view it as a, a non-parametric statistical methodology. Um, in, in particular, these networks are deep compositions of nonlinear functions. So we can think of a function H as a composition of, uh, let's say, L functions, if you have L layers in a network. And typically, these functions you can view as first take a linear function, a parameterized linear function, that's the, the WI up there, uh, and then pass that through a nonlinearity. Um, and, and perhaps the nonlinearity is, you know, in the, in the 90s, it was uh, always a sigmoid. Um, uh, more recently, the, these easier to compute piecewise linear functions are used, uh, and all sorts of other things. You know, there are various, you can think of um, uh, resnets and these buzzwords, max pooling and attention and gating and all kinds of things of this sort as particular nonlinearities of this sort. The crucial thing is that, you know, you, you have uh, uh, input-output data, you uh, 
uh, use a stochastic gradient kind of approach to adjust the parameters of this, of this uh, mapping, which, which are just these WIs, these matrices. Uh, uh, in order to get a, a good fit to the, to the training data. And that's typically done with a very simple-minded stochastic gradient uh, kind of approach. Okay, so that's, that's deep networks and, and viewing them as, as non-parametric um, uh, prediction method. You know, there are, there are some, some key issues that we want to think about here. There are, there's the approximation issue. What sort of functions can you represent with these kinds of, of uh, 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 structures? Um, the estimation issue, uh, which is, you know, we want to estimate a function that performs well, um, let's say, in expectation, and we're doing that from some finite sample. So, of course, there's, there's uh, going to be a trade-off between complexity and, and sample size requirements for that sort of thing. And, and the optimization issue. Um, uh, we have to come up with a function in that class of functions, uh, and, and we want to do that fast, right? So there's a computational problem of of finding a prediction rule that fits the data well, or more precisely, finding, finding a prediction rule that gives a good balance between, uh, between the, uh, the statistical complexity and, and the fit to the data. OK, so um, deep neural networks seem to give, I, I should say, deep learning methodology seems to give favorable trade-offs between these competing issues. Um, uh, you know, in particular, the computational question uh, empirically, we can, we can see that, that you can effectively always find a good fit to uh, essentially any, any data set. And, and rather strikingly, that good fit, the, the, the function that provides that good fit that emerges from these simple stochastic gradient methods uh, seems to give um, good estimation properties, seems to predict well on, on subsequent data. And we really don't understand why, and, and in a way we can precisely quantify. Um, so let me, let me go into that a little bit. And the estimation uh, uh, question, you know, we typically aim for a trade-off between the fit to the training data and uh, the complexity of a prediction rule. Uh, so for instance, in fit to the training data, we might be just thinking of a simple uh, 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 squared loss. Um, we might define an empirical risk as a sample average of a bunch of losses. So each of those LIs is, you know, the, the loss that's incurred on, on uh, uh, the ith element of a, of a training set. Uh, so for instance, for squared loss, that might be just the squared difference between our function's value at, at input xi, where the outcome is yi. Um, and the, the, the trade-off that we're usually concerned with is, is between that fit and the complexity of the rule f, and, and that could be measured in any number of ways, the number of parameters that define that function, um, perhaps the scale of those parameters, some norm of, of the vector of parameters, um, perhaps uh, a norm in a more general sense. A, 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 we might have f as a, an element of a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, and we're concerned with its, its norm. Uh, or for other non-parametric methods, um, you know, some sort of a smoothness property like the bandwidth of a smoothing kernel that we might, we might use. Many, many different ways we might measure complexity. But the, um, the common feature to, to uh, any non-parametric method is that there's some kind of a, um, a trade-off between these two, fit to the training data and the complexity of the prediction rule. Um, and, and of course, in, in non-parametrics, that's crucially important. OK, so here's, here's one beautiful example of uh, this sort of a, a trade-off, this, this uh, uh, paper of uh, Venkat, Ben, Pablo, and, and Alan. Uh, looking at inverse problems, uh, linear, linear inverse problems uh, where there's some, some structure uh, to the problem. So for instance, we might be doing linear regression and uh, we want to exploit the fact that we can do well with some uh, small number of non-zero coefficients. Or we might be concerned with estimating a, a low rank matrix or a low rank tensor. Um, or uh, perhaps coming up with uh, estimates of, of rankings where we uh, hypothesize that we can, uh, we can accurately model those as a mixture of a small number of, uh, of, of rankings. Um, you know, for these sorts of problems with this simple sort of structure, you know, this, this paper actually points to a very nice way of casting that as a convex optimization problem, um, uh, you know, and, and, and investigates when, when this is an effective uh, uh, approach to solving these, these uh, linear inverse problems. Uh, and the complexity measure here is a particular norm, all right? It's an atomic norm. 
um, based on whatever this notion of <coughs> simplicity is. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but then the, the optimization problem that emerges is minimize this complexity of the function subject to a constraint that the um, <coughs> empirical risk, the fit to the fit to the data, if you like, is is better than something. You know, satisfy some some condition. Okay, so you know this is this is very classical and and uh, you know I particularly like like this example, but this style of optimization problem is is a typical thing. Uh, and we could think of that optimization problem in in uh, of course a bunch of different um, uh, but equivalent ways. We might minimize this is this is Tikhonov regularization, right? We might minimize the uh, a combination of the empirical risk plus um, uh, some, some amount of uh, a regularizer that's, that's based on this complexity term omega, or we might minimize the empirical risk subject to a constraint on that complexity, right? So you can think about the, the um, uh, constraint set as defining a class of functions, the simple ones, right, with some bound B. Or we might turn it around. This is the form of the optimization problem we saw on the previous slide. Um, minimize the complexity subject to some constraint on the performance on the training data. Okay, so a bunch of different ways of looking at things. And the, the typical analysis of these things involves uniform convergence. If we look at the second form of the optimization problem, we have a, a class of functions. We're wanting to um, understand uh, how effectively minimizing the empirical risk across that class um, leads to good performance in the sense of the, the true risk, the uh, expectation of the loss that we're concerned with uh, here. Uh, and, and in order to do that, one, one approach to analysis is, is to look at uniform deviation bounds, to, to look at the maximum across that set of functions of the deviations between expectations and sample averages. And if we can guarantee that with high probability those deviations aren't too large, then for uh, certainly any function in that set, and in particular the one that is the solution, let's call it f hat, to that optimization problem, we're gonna have that its risk is close to its empirical risk, which was minimized, and so you know, the risk of this function is close to the best in this, in this set. This is you know, typical kind of analysis, might not always give optimal rates, but uh, you know, certainly you can um, uh, prove, uh, give, give performance guarantees in terms of this style of analysis. But it's clear from this that you know, we should be if we want to use this sort of argument, we should be considering the, the bound on the empirical risk here that's not much better than the best we could hope for. Right? We should certainly have this, this C defining our bound on the empirical risk um, at least as big as the, the Bayes risk, the best possible. Um, you know, that's obvious. Um, uh, and, and if we have uh, the empirical risk of the function that emerges much better than, than R star, than the Bayes risk, the best possible, then, then we're in an overfitting regime, right? We're, we're certainly fitting better than we should, than we should hope to. And we, we can't possibly have uniform convergence applying there. Um, uh, and so we might wonder why such an F would be, would be an effective um, uh, prediction rule. <clears throat> but that's exactly the regime where, where deep learning works. Um, uh, so, you know, there's this phenomenon, this is kind of the, the number one surprise, I think, from, from uh, deep learning methodology. So these, these methods produce uh, functions that achieve zero training error for regression loss, like this, this squared loss um, example, with near state-of-the-art performance. I mean, you can do a little better with some, some added regularization, but not a whole lot better, and that's really striking. Even when you're in a noisy, a noisy problem. So you're in the overfitting regime because this R star, um, you know, is, uh, this R star is significantly bigger than uh, uh, zero. Um, and, and so there seems to be, you know, when we're, when we're looking at things in, in, in this regime, there seems to be no trade-off between the fit to the training data and the, and the complexity. You know, we're not doing the, the standard non-parametric uh, approach. <clears throat> And, and these methods are still giving accurate performance. So I think this is really a new statistical phenomenon that, that has emerged from deep learning methodology. It's a really, a really striking thing uh, that, that hasn't been considered before, to the extent that you, know, you can look at uh, textbooks, the, the examples that we give in our undergraduate classes about you know, these balances between, between complexity and, uh, and predictive accuracy you know, are exactly of this form. If you're, Take a polynomial that's too high a degree, you'll be interpolating the data. Of course, that's a terrible idea, right? So um, you know, it really, it really does uh, uh, go against statistical 
statistical wisdom. So that's a rather striking thing. Okay, so um, um, this was a phenomenon that, that really um, uh, emerged as, as something very interesting at a, a Simons Institute program on foundations of machine learning in, in spring 2017. Since then, there's been a whole lot of work um, uh, at, at looking at this phenomenon. I, I would say not for deep learning methods, but for um, uh, other things that are simpler to analyze. And I'll tell you about one of those, um, which is a linear, oh, I should point out, I guess, um, you know, there, there's a, a real lids presence here. Sasha Ruckland's done a bunch of, of really exciting work in, in this direction. Um, so, so, you know, some of these results about reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces, um, for instance, is uh, uh, a, a, a really very exciting. Um, let me tell you about a result for a linear setting. This is joint work with Phil Long, Gabo Lugoshi, and Alex Sigler. So uh, linear regression, squared loss, um, uh, the, the regularizer, the complexity here is the norm of that, of that linear function, the norm of the, the parameter vector, if you want to think of a finite dimensional case. Think of x, y as jointly Gaussian. You can do things more generally. And, and you can get a characterization of when the minimum norm uh, interpolating function, the one that matches the data, has an expected uh, uh, squared error close to the optimal uh, and, and, you know, bounded above and below in terms of quantities that depend on uh, a sort of effective rank of the covariance in a subspace orthogonal to the highest variance directions, you know, uh, a certain subspace orthogonal to these highest variance directions. Um, you know, and the intuition there is that, that uh, you need to have this subspace where you've got small magnitude covariance, it's very high dimension, and low eccentricity. Um, and, and that's necessary and sufficient for being able to fit the data precisely and still predict, predict well. So this is a regime that you know, nobody has uh, apparently uh, uh, considered in, um, uh, in, in, in the classical, classical theory, although very classical problem. Okay, so as I say, you know, these are for, for problems where, where the analysis is amenable. Uh, we really don't have... Um, uh, don't understand very much about the deep learning setting for this kind of this kind of phenomenon. So that's that's the first surprise. Um, very quickly, the second surprise, the, the second uh, you know mystery, I think, is this this notion of implicit regularization. So if we think about these sort of uh, optimization problems, we're in the overfitting regime. Uh, stochastic gradient descent seems to find deep networks that satisfy that overfitting constraint, uh, and they predict accurately. Um, uh, so what is it that they're minimizing? What is stochastic gradient doing? What's the regularizer look like um, if it is indeed a, a, um, a regularizer? This really blurs the boundaries uh, in particular between optimization and, and estimation. It's the optimization algorithm that's leading to the favorable regularization properties, um, uh, favorable statistical properties. Um, there's been... Uh, a fair amount of work in this direction. Um, you know, I've, I've highlighted the, the work of uh, Nati Srebro and, and collaborators, but I think it's a fair summary to say that this is really for linearly parameterized things or, or, or slight tweaks on linearly parameterized things, so, so far from the, the deep learning setting, and, and I think there's a, that's a really fascinating direction also. Okay, so that's, there, there are a, a couple of the mysteries that deep learning has, has uh, Unearthed, I think they're they're really important questions, you know, because of the practical um, uh, impact of of these methods. Um, the second and, and and much shorter part of the talk is looking at uh, computational issues in uh, rather simple statistical estimation problems. So, um, uh, for instance, think about the problem of estimating the mean of a distribution in RD. Okay, couldn't get much simpler than that. You have a sample of size n, and you'd like to estimate the mean. Um, it seems like a certainly a very classical thing. What do we mean by estimate the mean? With high probability, our, our estimate uh, is close, let's say, in Euclidean distance. <clears throat> and, and how hard is this computationally? So, okay, so if our distribution is, is nice, if it's Gaussian or, 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 or something similar, then uh, we can just take a, a sample average, and, and that's great. All right, and we get you know, the, the optimal um, uh, estimate uh, in the sense of, you know, we get the square root of dimension over sample size plus log of one over that probability of failure, or square root of log of one over delta divided by the sample size. And, and that's the best we could hope for. 
Um, but what happens you know, in a more realistic situation? What happens if we have weaker, some weaker assumptions like just a second moment existing? Uh, how, how, how hard is it to estimate the mean in that case? Empirical mean is no good, right? It's sensitive to outliers. Um, in one dimension, you could take a median of means, come up with a bunch of buckets, order log one over delta buckets, uh, separate the data into those, compute the mean within each, and then take a median. And, and you know, then you get something that looks like order square root log one over delta over n, and that's the best you can do. But in d dimensions, uh, it's problematic, because what you really want is a, a median of means in all directions in some sense. Right? And it's the all directions part that's, that's difficult. It wasn't even known until recently you know, what the optimal rate was here. So Lugosi and Mendelssohn showed that uh, you had the same rate as sub-Gaussian data. Um, uh, but computing it is problematic. They presented a kind of tournament um, algorithm that, uh, a method that, that looked in, in exponentially many directions in some sense. Um, <clears throat> Sam Hopkins showed you could use the sum of squares machinery, right? So the um, uh, semi-definite programming sort of, sort of approaches um, to provide an efficient estimator that was really a kind of sum of squares rewrite of the proof in the Lugosi Mendelssohn paper and um, of course, uh, not such a practical thing. Um, but it turns out you can use the, the same sort of ideas, right? So you can come up with a simple descent-based method that basically, you know, uh, looks for, a, what, what you want is that in every direction, most of those buckets project, the me, means of most of those buckets project to something that's close to your estimate. Uh, and so you're wanting to find, <clears throat> turns out you can use that to define a descent, descent method. Um, that's, that's based on a uh, semi-definite program. Okay, so you know, there's a particular prob uh, positive example. Um, you know, what can we say on, on the other side? How hard are these estimation problems? I think this is, this is really interesting and, and fundamental. Um, you know, is the computational boundary different from the information theoretic um, uh, boundary? Um, are there reductions between estimation problems? Um, you know, are there canonical hard estimation problems? I think this is a really, really fascinating and important area, and um, you know, there's been some some great work in this direction um, uh, that that Philippe and and, and Guy uh, in particular have have come up with, and I think Guy is going to tell us a bit about that in the in the panel panel discussion. Okay, so um, uh, you know, I think this. Tension between computation and, and statistics, optimization and estimation, is really, is really a crucial issue in foundations of machine learning. It's a very exciting um, direction. Um, uh, you know, there are many others, and we'll hear about those in the, in the panel. Um, uh, but I did want to say, you know, thanks for uh, uh, in, inviting me to the, uh, to the, the celebration here, and uh, uh, I'm glad to see the 80-year-old the in, in such good shape. So thank you. For a wonderful talk, so we have a couple of questions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> so there's this uh, double descent um, uh, observation that uh, if you in, in uh, many settings, if you pick a sequence of sub, let's say if you're in an infinite dimensional setting and you pick a sequence of subspaces uh, of increasing dimension, uh, that you see in the classical regime, you see this, um, uh, you know, as the dimension increases, you see things get better as the approximation error decreases and then get worse as the estimation error decreases. But once you go beyond the dimension of, uh, the, that corresponds to the sample size, you might see a, a decrease again. Um, so, you know, in some, in some cases, you know, the, so that big list of references I flash by can prove that if you pick those subspaces in a particular random way, that, that you will see that sort of behavior, you know, either something that gets worse or something that asymptotes perhaps to something better. Um, in fact, you know, what the characterization shows is that you can find uh, in an infinite dimensional setting, you can find a sequence of subspaces where past the sample size uh, area, things do essentially whatever you want them to do. You know, so you can have, uh, subject to some Lipschitz constraints on that function and, and one over the function or something, right? You can have things go up and down any which way. 
Um, so it's, it's not a universal phenomenon. It's, it's a phenomenon that seems to, seems to appear in lots of practical situations, though. So, you know, yeah, very interesting. Thank you for your great talk. So how about uh, if we borrow fuzzy mathematics principles to build a deep fuzzy neural network? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, not really uh, such an expert on fuzzy, um, fuzzy neural networks, so I'm not, I couldn't comment. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so if not, so then let's have coffee and we can still ask you questions in the panel because we're already minus five minutes about. So okay. let's do that. Thank you very much. Thank you.